Hello and welcome to this latest Business Leader Insight interview where I'll be talking today to businessman, investor and Dragon's Den favourite Theo Pathetis. For those of you watching for the first time and unfamiliar with Business Leader, do check us out at www.businessleader.co.uk. Well, thank you for uh, your time and joining us today, Theo. Um, I want to just start, uh, start at the beginning of your life. Understand that, that um, from what I've read, school may not have been your best experience and, and the teachers you've had. I just want to get an insight into if you could go back to the people that you were at school with now and talk to them. What what, what would you say to them, Theo? I think that's always a difficult thing to uh, to do, Ollie. I, I, I have a major issue with judging people in the past by today's standards because that's what evolution is about. That's what progress is about. We don't have a stagnant uh, life cycle. There's learnings on way. And it'd be, it'd be harsh to chastise people who weren't given the information, hadn't had the training, weren't made aware of various issues at a point in time by the knowledge we have today. And, and, that, and that goes across the board with lots of things that are happening in today's society. And it really drives me mad to be perfectly honest because it's good that we progress it's good that we learn from our mistakes it's good that we realize that things that we did in the past probably weren't right and we can do them so much better now it's good that we realize that words that were regularly broadcast on national television on prime time television would be considered abhorrent now and you know it would make front page news it's good that we do these things and it's good that these words and actions that were acceptable 30 40 50 years 60 years ago are now not in the vocabulary of the youngsters coming through whereas people of my age those words and actions are still in our vocabulary and in our DNA because we live through it. We really got to not, and it, it, it's something that society is doing badly in my view at the moment. We've got to stop beating ourselves up about our past and look forward to the future and actually rejoice in the knowledge that we've got. And I can tell you about what I was called as a kid in the streets of Gorton in Manchester in the 60s which now you'd go, oh, my God. But actually, at the time, not only did the kids that called me those names not know better, which I'm sure they do now, but I didn't know better. And it's only when you realise that you can cause hurt with words or actions that you realise, actually, they're unnecessary and they shouldn't be used. So I'm a great one now to say, look, Let's look to the future. And it's marvellous that my children um, and my grandchildren don't even have some of those words in their vocabulary. Don't, it's not something that would at all come to mind in, in expression, innocently or otherwise. So I can't go back and criticise my teachers. What I did have was great, was one particular teacher that was really helpful. And he took a shine to me. And that was Mr. Priddle, who was also uh, a, a head of year. And he realised that whilst I was hugely struggling at uh, school, I was actually quite bright. He took a class as a relief teacher when one of the teachers was sick. And he just took the lesson and pulled me afterwards and said, I want to see you in my, in my study. And I thought, oh, what have I done? He sat me down and went through my three years at that school and all the streams and forms I was in and picked out various things and said, well, why are you good at this? And he was talking about maths. I said, I don't know. Just that. He said, why do you think you're not as good at English or history or other subjects? I said, I don't know. Because I find it hard to understand. And he did a logic test on me. Within a week, all my classes were rearranged. I've been moved up various sets, uh, and he recognised that I was struggling with what is commonly now known as dyslexia, but wasn't a problem as far as numbers was concerned. So that's what gave him the confidence that actually I was bright, I was able 
to learn, just couldn't quite learn in the way that the comprehensive school in the 70s in North London had been equipped to deal with. Whereas my kids, who also have been dyslexic, had all the help in the world. It was assessed and recognised very, very quickly, and they all went on to, uh, to do really well for themselves. And that's the point I'm trying to make. It's good that we learn, and we shouldn't be beating ourselves up about the past or hold grudges, because the past it, it is just a small section of our journey to the present and the future. No, thank you, um, Thea. I think that's um, yeah, a, a really insightful and, and definitely uh, interesting to hear your thoughts on on the on the progress uh, we've made. And <clears throat> you mentioned kind of maths and logic then. And as I understand, you started in business when you were fifteen. I mean, can you tell us why you wanted to go into business? And and if you wouldn't have been a successful businessman, what what do you feel you might you might have been prisoner? <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Listen, it's interesting. Uh, I, I'm gonna recite another question I'm often asked is why on this subject why do you think so many dyslexic people are successful entrepreneurs and simply it's because they couldn't get a job anywhere else nobody would take them on they were bright people certainly capable but on the basis nobody would give them a job they have to create their own job and that's why you got lots of self-employed people people running businesses who I haven't got a huge amount of qualifications because they've had to make it for themselves. They're bright individuals, good at some things, not so good at other things. But the overall trait they all have is one of logic and common sense. And common sense, as we've discovered over the years, is not common. People like me didn't really have a lot of choices about what I wanted to be. I thought I might want to be a policeman. That didn't happen. But I mean, in some ways, it wasn't meant to be. I, I must have made 100 applications for jobs when I left school at 16. In those days, you have to fill in a, send a letter in or a form in, and you wait for a reply for an interview it's in the mail. And, you know, out of 100 applications, I probably got 10 or 12 replies, all of which were, uh, uh, thank you, but no thanks. So it was difficult to find work. So you did really have to go and um, search out. That's it. And do, do you think that kind of toughened you up? And, and almost, if you w would have had all those opportunities and qualifications, you probably wouldn't have had the, like you say, some of that logic, common sense, some of those qualities that you need in business. I would have been doing something totally different because I probably would, if I could do exams or I, I could do, I was academic, I probably would have gone down a different career path. Nobody in my family was an entrepreneur. I didn't have business in the family wasn't something I had to look up to and have a guided path. We were working class. And then that was it. I didn't set out to an entrepreneur. It, it was something that was a pathway that was open to me, that I could follow without too much resistance and without the academic qualifications. Well, thanks for that, um, Theon. I just want to now talk about your time at Millwall. I'm a, I'm a massive football fan, so I'm quite interested to get your insight. In, I mean, the football environment is crazy, probably even crazier than, than it was when you were there. You know, what, what got you into that and, and why didn't you continue and find another club? So, so you're a massive football fan. Um, mm. so I'm, I'm going to say to you, that's a hell of a stupid question. Then. <laughs> Again, I didn't set out to be chairman of a football club. When I was in Manchester, Manchester United was my team. Came to London, lived at Highbury, went to lots of Arsenal games but could never really be a supporter. And then in my mid-teens, when I met uh, Mrs P, she lived in um, South London. So I used to spend quite a bit of time down there with a group of friends and discovered, yes, you got it, Millwall Football Club. It was an easy club to support, as difficult as it is to support that club sometimes. So I started following Millwall from those days, not realising many, many years after that uh, I would end up being chairman of the club and being involved for eight amazing years in my, in my life. I wouldn't change it for the world. As a club, it's much maligned and misunderstood because it's easy, easy media for them. But when I was there for eight years, I can tell you, 
it was as much as a family club, if not more than any other club. Uh, and we had a great atmosphere, great support, and we had amazing success for a club where the average gate was like 10,000 a week in the championship, where you were playing clubs that had 30,000, 40,000 in their stadiums. You know, when, when you run something like a football club, obviously you're... Is, is it like running a business or did you have to adapt and change? Is it, is it completely different? I mean, did you learn, did you learn new things about how to, how to run? I guess it's a different world, is it? I learned lots of new things. I learned exactly how not to run a business. Quite frankly, it's only the first half of the Premier League that was ever run as a business for a long time. Recently, in the last decade, I would say. Before that, just a few clubs were run as businesses. Most clubs have benefactors. They're not businesses. I, I learned to keep my gob shut, when to open it and when not to open it, when to uh, jest and not to jest, how to deal with the media. And so, so I learned loads of things, not all good. And, but I had eight amazing years. And the time after eight years, I felt I'd done as much as I could do. I'd given eight years of my life. And believe me, no regrets because I got just as much out as I gave in. I was very, you know, I, I would definitely relive those years again. Uh, but it was time to move on. Oh, thanks, um, uh, T. I just want to now um, get back on to, um, yeah, business. Uh, and I just want to um, get your insight into what you feel are the ingredients and mindset people need. So, you know, we come across lots of business leaders through, through our network that they might be turning over a million. And that their kind of vision is, you know, imagine getting to 5 million, but then you get some people like yourself and other business leaders who, who end up being 300 million plus, up to a billion. Do you, you know, what, what do you need to kind of create a business of that scale and, and, and that mindset? Well, first of all, you've got to be in, a, in an industry where there's a demand and it's, and it's scalable. You've got to be in a business that is scalable. Some businesses are just not scalable and that's as far as it goes. But, you know, no one sets out and says, I'm going to start a business and I, I'm going to make it immediately into a, a billion pound business. You've got to have a business that is scalable and is not dependent on one person. Some businesses, you know, depend on one person can only ever be a million pound because they can depend on one person. And that's all that person can, so many hours in a day that they can do. But when you can scale, that's when you've got the ability to dream of those sort of numbers. On that point, uh, there, there is some kind of studies and research around that. But in, in the UK, people tend to exit quicker than in, in America and Germany, for example. And it's often meant that, yes, we have the, the, the versions of this uh, world, but you know, some of the big brands, Facebook, Tesla, Twitter, Amazon, BMW, you know, they, those kind of legacy empire businesses, they're, they're, they're kind of non-British. I mean, it's a great thing that people can start companies and exit. But why, why do you think the Americans mainly are more inclined to maybe think longer term with their companies? I mean, I, I hear what you're saying, that there's evidence of this. I'm not sure, I, I've not seen that evidence, um, and I wasn't aware. The difference with the States, historically, is quite simple. There's always been more risk funding. There's always been more money. So entrepreneurs could always find, have access to markets and cash. It's always been a lot more difficult in the UK. We've been, we've been pretty historically bad at this. So it's been difficult for people to find, get access to cash to grow businesses. And that's why sometimes they sell them and then somebody else grows them because they've got more access to cash. And on that on that subject of, of, of money investing into business, I want to move on to your, your role at, at Dragon's Den, which obviously you're very well known for. When you're investing, do you ever invest or have you invested in somebody that you just like them, that they might not have had all the numbers and, and all the, the things, but you just like the person you want to help them? Or, or do you always invest against a formula and, and you need to see that return? I think the answer to your question is always. After the first series, I very quickly realised that a good person with an average idea was a better investment than somebody that was lousy with a good idea. Who thought they'd won the lottery, I'm going to sit back, smoke a cigar, and expected me to run their business for them and make them rich. Certainly after my first season, it was a quick lesson for me. And from then onwards, it was all about the individuals. If I liked them, thought I could work with them, and the idea was half decent, I was in. If someone had a really good idea but found them obnoxious or difficult to deal with or 
difficult to get the truth out of them or extract information from them. Uh, I didn't feel I could trust them. I wasn't in. I mean, you kind of touched on that there a little bit. But if, if there's anyone, well, when people do view this and, and, and they maybe look into to talk to investors, what kind of advice would you give them when, when, when you're pitching to get somebody else's money? What, what are the things that you like and, and really don't like? I love passion. But passion alone isn't going to get you the investment. But it's certainly something I look for. Homework, research, understanding of your market, your customer, the need for what you want to do out there in the, mar- in the market. You really have to show that you understand those things before you start asking people for money. Um, and if you haven't done your homework and it's just because your mum told you it was a good idea when you mentioned it to her, or your dad, or, you know, three Fs, family, fools, and friends, who said, here's a couple of thousand quid to get you on your way, I'll invest. They just want to be polite and nice to you. Then that's wrong. You know, you've got to show that you've challenged your ideas, that you accepted that it might not all be plain sailing, uh, and you've made provisions in your calculations and sensitivities, Mm. but that you've challenged the reason for your existence your business to exist out there in the market and that there is a fair market that you can exist in. There's no point saying to me, oh, I only want 1% of the market and it's a £5 trillion market. Well, believe you me, it's hard to get 1% of a trillion pound market. You've just got to show how you're going to do it. And uh, you're going to have enough cash. And what you're asking for is enough to actually make it work. It's hard to find reasons not to love the West Country. We've been serving clients here for a quarter of a century and we're planning on doing more. Through our offices in Bristol and Exeter, we cover a huge area, Penzance to Pembrokeshire, Bath to Bournemouth. And at a time when others have retrenched to London, we're strengthening our presence here by expanding our team. We're hiring the right people to address the needs of our growing client base. Our Buffett Latham has been on a big expansion journey over the past five years. We're five times bigger for a start. We now offer private and commercial banking, wealth planning, investment management and specialist finance. It's been a difficult few months for so many of us, but we're a relationship-led bank and we've been very proactive in reaching out to our clients to make sure we're still delivering the quality of service which they expect. We're proud to be part of the business community in our part of the world and we're ideally placed to work with our clients in the months and the years ahead. As well as being relationship-led, we're entrepreneurial and have a focus on the long term. We're always here for our clients, for business, for family, for life. Obviously, the last year, um, you know, I don't need to tell you what's kind of happened, and, and you know uh, retail inside out, and it, it's obviously been hit hard. Um, what do you see as the future kind of for retail now? And do you see it coming back strong um, from, from the pandemic? I do see us getting back. I mean, we've got, some, we've got a hell of a challenges ahead of us. But I do believe whether you think they've done it in an efficient manner or in the right manner or they've covered everybody, that's, you know, it's a difficult job. But I do think the government adopted the absolute correct plan of making sure that there is an economy to come back to when we open up. And they didn't make the same mistakes as we've made historically in the past when we've hit recessions. So I think the money that's gone into the economy has kept it alive. And there's a hell of a lot of pent-up demand there from consumers, from businesses who can't wait to get trading again. And they're all ready to go. Staff and colleagues have been retained um, through the furlough scheme. So they're ready to come back to work. And I do think we're going to hit the ground running for my industry. It's April the 12th when our shops can open again. And our colleagues are desperate to get back to work. Uh, and I know consumers are desperate to get back out again. And there will be pent up demand. So I think that's good. Will we go straight to where we were pre pandemic? No. Uh, it also will take time. People's habits have changed as well. Their spending habits have changed. So that needs to be taken into account. Then there's a little point of Brexit. I mean, it's just it's a side show. I mean, I can remember getting into debates with people saying, 
If we leave the EU, our economy won't grow as fast as it would have done if we stayed in the EU over the next three years by up to £17 billion. Pounds. And me, Bagatelle, may say now, <laughs> in the scheme of uh, £22 billion for track and trace, yeah. uh, another £12 billion. So it has faded into the background, but it has still got teething problems and difficulties that we need to deal with. But I'm confident that we'll deal with those. That doesn't mean I poo-poo or underestimate the hardship that some people are having or will continue to have while we get over this leaving the EU and the new trading agreements between us as a third nation, um, a third party nation, and the EU. And some of the pettiness that's still on there. I mean, it, it still exists, both on both sides, by the way. And I saw that quite clearly from my Twitter account when I was on question time and I was asked, I voted and I said, I voted leave. And I wrote about it. It's no secret. I mean, I wrote about it on my website. God, there's so many articles I've written and been on television says there's no secret. But also, I think the key part before all the trolls and the Ramonas go on and start moaning on Twitter, I never said it was going to be a cakewalk. I actually said we'd encounter difficulties and the level of difficulties will depend purely on the quality and the negotiations of the government in charge, our politicians. But I felt that kicking the Brexit can down the road for another generation or two was wrong and I'd rather take the pain now. Mm. And undoubtedly there's going to be some pain because I believe for the medium and long term it's a right thing. For the country but there will be pain and you know as the mist of the pandemic starts lifting and we get to focus on some of the difficulties our exit agreement has created because it was remember a shotgun wedding last minute shotgun wedding it was either you get married not liking each other or you just don't get married at all <laughs> but it but it probably safer if you got married so there's not two happy parties there. And there's a lot of pettiness, which is, we've got to get through. Do you think, Theo, that um, with the UK uh, leaving and, and how we've done that, obviously, is, is debatable. And, and But do you, do you think other countries might, might want to leave the European Union? Um, I think there will be. I think there's, there's quite a few countries that are unhappy with the bureaucracy and the heavy handedness of the one nation, one state of the EU. And it is. They're going to the United States of Europe. We know you can't have monetary union without economic and fiscal union. It, you can't. You can't say a German euro is worth the same as a euro in Portugal, Spain, and they don't share the same fiscal responsibilities. And to have fiscal responsibilities, you've got to have political responsibilities. It, that, that's the difficulty. And when you look at the quality of some of the people that have been running the EU and some of the decisions made, it's quite frightening. Whether you like our government, this government, or the Labour Party, or whoever represents the Labour Party at any particular moment in time, or the Tory Party, I guarantee you they won't be as crass as the people who are running the EU. Because they're accountable. But these guys are not accountable. It's definitely an interesting point. And it'll be interesting to see, like you say, when the mist of the pandemic settles, you know, will the uh, EU strengthen its resolve? Or will, will other countries start to come forward when they've dealt with this pandemic and say, actually, I, I want to leave too? It's, I think it's going to be fascinating to see that. Well, interesting, uh, well, that pettiness over the AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca vaccine, where because the French and the Germans screwed up royally on their vaccines, their politi for political consumption... They took the decision to poo-poo our successful rollout on the basis that the vaccine we were using was second rate and wasn't suitable for their nations, which is comical mm. because only a little time further on, they're bitching they couldn't get hold of the vaccine and had to do a complete U-turn. And they pressed the button on the Irish protocol which in itself showed you the level of stupidness and pettiness and the fact that they allowed some halfwit, the ability singularly to make that decision. 
it, yeah. it, 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 beyond forgiveness, to be honest with you. But it's totally pettiness that's going on at the moment in our ports, our customs uh, requirements, and that's going to stop. And we're going yeah, to say no. we need to coexist together, and we've left. The divorce has happened. Let's not damage our children, damage our public and our citizens over it. Yeah, no, I, I think I totally agree. I think it's been interesting to see the the stats, isn't it? I think we're we're almost 40 percent ahead on the rollout of the vaccine compared to Europe because of that that pettiness you say, and, and they've had to backtrack anyway and and, and use the use the vaccine, haven't they? So uh, no, it, it's definitely quite quite evident that it's it's a, a lot of these are political decisions, aren't they? Not not um, common sense. Well, it's, it's quite bad, and, and that's what you get, and that's the problem. Now we know politics is. We suffer from it here as well. I mean, some decisions that were made by this government undoubtedly are political uh, and not economical. You've kind of had lots of different campaigns that you've worked on. I mean, what, what, what kind of, what, what is your, obviously, aside from your business, what is your passion now? I mean, what kind of keeps you up at night? What, 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 what would you like to see sort of change in, in society and the way we kind of do things? Well, lots of things keep me up at night at the moment. It's just even in dark eyes. Um, <laughs> uh, but I've been campaigning very strongly on business rates because, you know, that, that to is a single point that's destroying our high street, destroying our retail world, and the unfairness of taxing physical retail when you're not taxing online retail. It's comical when big multinationals come to the UK, take swathes of our economy, and don't pay their fair share of tax. That's got to stop. I mean, business rates is a tax from the 1500s. It was yeah. the poor. You know, ye old internet didn't exist in those days. But you can't have big companies paying no tax here, whether they're social media companies, whether they're uh, online retail companies or whatever. The fact is, if you're taking revenue from this country, you've got to pay your fair share of tax. We've got our national health to pay for. We've got police to pay for. We've got the other social services to pay for, fire, ambulance, all these things, army. You know, so, uh, these are going to be paid. You can't have organisations swanning in, taking swathes of our consumer spending and through tax havens channeling out and not paying. Do you think there's the, there's the will to do that? Um, do, do you think that, that will happen? Well, there hasn't been the will, in fairness. And we've had previously some very poor chancellors. Mm. I mean, incredibly appalling chancellors. I mean, so far, Rishi Sunak has done, I think, a reasonable job with the hand he's been dealt. He's done a good job with the hand he's been dealt. And it's taken the right decisions. Generally, I'm sure there's decisions that I disagree with and your listeners and viewers will also, and readers, will have things that they disagree with. But if you've got to take it in, in the round and try and be fair before we chastise them. And it does seem that he is willing to look at business rates. He's already extended partially the business rate holiday and there's a review on business rates being deferred to the August. And I can see why it's been deferred, because we only see how the economy comes out of this. When they did a review, we didn't have the pandemic. So what was arrived at from the, the review prior to the pandemic might not necessarily be the right thing now. So we've got to be realistic. So I'm prepared to give him, you know, cut him some slack on that. As for tax evasion, stroke avoidance, you know, you decide. And I'm sure as far as the law is, con the law is concerned, these company will, companies will tell you it's avoidance. And that's what they hide behind. So we have to change the law. But it's difficult to change the law in isolation. You need other countries to do so as well. It's difficult for one country to do it. But we have to do it. We can't have the, what's happening at the moment. So we need a fairer taxation and to be able then to keep our physical as well as our online retail. And I'm involved in both. And there's a place for both. But I also do love physical and the ability for people to go out, interact, meet people. And, you know, a lot of our shops are the core and the heart of their society. And we shouldn't destroy that. I uh, definitely agree. And, and some interesting insight. It's going to be interesting to see certainly how things evolve in terms of paying back uh, what we've borrowed as well, Theo. I just want to now um, talk to you about Small Business Sunday. Um, for those of 
uh, our viewers that don't know about that. Can you just tell us what that is and, and, and why you do it? Ten years ago, um, I discovered Twitter and realised I had a great reach. I only had 50,000 followers, but for, for salesmen, somebody who started their own business and was always looking to market, you know, the thought of being able to market to 50,000 people when I was a small business was mind-boggling for me. So I thought, wouldn't it be great to share that with other people that were are now in the position I was all those years ago? After I put the kids to bed, I would sit there and work out my strategy for the following week. And it was more about getting new customers, marketing, and everything else. And I said, if, if, if anybody out there has got a small business, if you tweet me with something interesting about your business, I'll tweet. Uh, six of my favourites. And without realising it, I started something which 10 years later consists of uh, a business community of several thousand small businesses where we've got local as well as national meetings which are self-supporting and it's all free. They get to go on the SPS website, they get to interact with each other, self-support, lots of business help. If they win, they can put a... Um, a press release out that we supply them with, which is, you know, TV Dragon, Theo Profesius picks, you know, Daisy's Flowers from Rochester, and they give it to their local newspaper. It knocks the story of the cat stuck up on the tree from the front page uh, and gives them some more marketing ability and allows them to reach a whole new community. And basically all they've got to do on a Sunday between 5 and 7.30 is just send me... Uh, a brief tweet about their businesses and on a Monday uh, I will then pick six of my favourites but more importantly you know as a small business I can remember when things go tough for you you need someone to speak to and when you're part of a community where there's thousands of other small businesses in your area as well or in your sector that you can interact with share ideas and in those dark miserable winter evenings where you're trying to do your books and trying to work out where you're going to go from here. It's just that little bit of light that helps them. So that's what uh, hashtag SPS is. I think it's a great initiative. We, we, we see it all the time. And, and certainly, you know, when you're in business, it is a lonely place, isn't it? So that, that community's uh, great. So fantastic initiative there. I just want to ask you as well, um, uh, Theo, one, one final question. What is one fact about you that we can't find online? A lot of them are about me the last few years. Uh, I sometimes wear funny clothes, including green tights, <laughs> and hang around forests, <laughs> um, doing things with a group of people, most of which, by the way, are far, far more well-known than me, and probably the least well-known. Yeah. Um, which, which we call uh, archery. It's Old English longbows. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> so I'm glad um, you said archery. <laughs> uh, using the old traditional old English longbows, which is something I got I got into a good few years ago. Oh well, god, about ten years ago. And it's great it's it's great fun. It's really it's traditional great fun. And it's uh done in, in some woods in Surrey. I'm not doing as much as I used to, but it used to be a regular on a Sunday and the barbecue afterwards. Oh, no, thanks, um, Theo. I mean, th those are my questions. I want to say, you know, I'm, I'm yeah, personal massive fan, Theo. So it was a real pleasure to talk to you today. Um, really, thank you for your time. And um, yeah, if there's anything you wanted to add to uh, uh, to our audience, please, please do. I uh, know. I think we've been we've been uh, quite open, and we've talked about a wide variety of things. Uh, all that I can say is, I'm quite excited. I think there's opportunity when there's disruption, as there has been. There's opportunity for small businesses who want to start their own business. Uh, there has not been a better time. You just got to look and seek, and you will see, as the man says. People's habits are changing. They are susceptible to new opportunities. So this is the time for us to really get our economy flying again. And I do honestly believe that our economy will come out of this driven by entrepreneurism, mm. because we're we're faster, we're more agile, and we're quicker to react. <laughs>